Um, well, we've known what the most important numbers are from a natural science perspective, and it's essentially the, the nitrogen and phosphorus load. Uh, we've been aware of this for almost 40 years, that the bay is suffering from an excess of uh, nitrogen and phosphorus, or nutrients, which come from any number of sources, come from agricultural sources, from the atmosphere, from basically everything and anything we put on the land, and anything we discharged into our bodies of water, uh, including uh, sewage discharge, which is a, a big source of this. And so the bay is essentially suffering from over-enrichment of a good thing. We're giving it too many nutrients, too many vitamins, if you will, and it, it fosters uh, algae blooms, which lead to uh, severe oxygen depletion within our bodies of water uh, and essentially massive dead zones where virtually nothing can survive. The, the biggest single source of pollutants right now is, is agricultural sources. And this is both the things that we put on our lands for fertilizer, but it's also the, the waste that comes out of the massive uh, poultry farms on the eastern shore, the, the swine farms, the cattle farms in the Susquehanna River um, Valley, uh, and, and so on. And just for an example, there are currently a half a billion chickens that are being raised on the eastern shore of Maryland and Virginia. And each one of those will have a life expectancy of about a year before they're, they're slaughtered. And each one of those will produce about a pound of waste, chicken litter, uh, in the course of their life. That's a half a billion pounds of chicken litter, of which there's no systematic way to dispose of it. So we use it for fertilizer, even when there's no need for fertilizer. In the winter, we've historically stored it very poorly. It's contaminated the groundwater, the rivers, and we end up in a situation where some of the most rustic and beautiful regions on the eastern shore of, Mar of Maryland and Virginia have some of the most polluted waterways. Okay, so there's a distinction to be made. There's, a, there's, there's point sources of pollution and non-point sources of pollution. Anything that comes out at the end of a pipe is considered point sources of pollution. And from a regulatory perspective, uh, that's the stuff that we have a pretty good grasp on. So the Clean Water Act and other regulatory tools allow us to regulate those people that do direct discharges into our bodies of water. And that would include things like stormwater, outfalls, and sewage treatment plants. The problem is the non-point sources, those things that don't come through a pipe in a concentrated manner, but that we spread on the land. And that would include things like chicken litter uh, and, and poultry waste and, and waste from cattle and fertilizers we put on our golf courses and our homes uh, and, and everything else. And so there's a, the real problem is that we have a pretty good grasp on regulating these point sources. They're pretty easy, but the non-point sources still remain mostly unregulated. There have been, there's been three major agreements for the Chesapeake Bay. There was the original agreement in 1983. There was a, in that agreement just essentially said that the, the Bay state states, the signatories of the Bay Agreement were going to work hard to restore the Chesapeake Bay to some reasonable level. In 1987, they created a, a new Bay Agreement, and for the first time they put a number on it. And so they said they were going to reduce nitrogen and phosphorus by 40% of the 1985 levels. And so now they quantified it, and they gave themselves the goal of 2,000 to, to make that, to, to achieve those limits. They subsequently uh, reduced their, their ambitious goal by making a, an artificial distinction between controllable and non-controllable nutrients, and we can talk about that later. But 2,000 rolled around, and no matter how you measured it, they didn't meet their goals. They didn't meet them for phosphorus, they didn't meet them for nitrogen even though they had said that they were on track for meeting them for phosphorus and they were pretty darn close for nitrogen. It turns out, in, in, in retrospect, they weren't close for either one. So now in 2000, they made another set of goals, and their deadline for this time was 2010. 2010 rolled around, and by and large, they still haven't met their goals, not for nitrogen, not for phosphorus, not for sediments, not for any major pollution uh, pollutant that enters the Chesapeake Bay. 
Exactly. Yeah. They use 1985 as their as their starting point, and they wanted to reduce it 40% 40, 40 below 1985 levels. Yeah. It's the, uh, the, Chess the EPA's Chesapeake Bay Program, which has been the, the lead organization uh, in this federal and state and local partnership. So the, the Chesapeake Bay Program has an office in, in Eastport, Maryland. They, they have a, a staff of, of several people. They, they coordinate the efforts between the state and local governments. And they're responsible for monitoring the success of, of their program, which is the Chesapeake Bay Program, which in, in, in theory is supposed to be the implementation arm of the Chesapeake Bay Agreements that I talked about before. The problem with the Bay Agreements is that they're all voluntary. That there, there is no additional regulatory power in any of these Bay Agreements. And so instead of having additional regulatory powers above and beyond what the Clean Water Act provided, the Bay Agreements were seen as a voluntary consensus-based alternative to fully enforcing the Clean Water Act. And so it was a, a grand experiment in, in voluntary environmental stewardship. And after now 10, 20, 30 years, um, many people have concluded that the experiment has failed and it's time to get back to these hard-hitting regulatory approaches that were put in place with the Clean Water Act in the early 1970s. So the, even though we chose for, for more than two decades to pretend like the Clean Water Act didn't exist, and to pursue this voluntary, consensus-based approach to environmental uh, uh, management. The Clean Water Act was always there. And so some people um, sued, and they sued that, that, that the Bay Program and the EPA and the state partners were not upholding their end of the Clean Water Act. And so that's, that's what happened. In 2010, after the third deadline had come and go, gone, and the Bay still hadn't been removed from the the EPA's list of impaired bodies of water, uh, it, it was time to get back to basics. And so now the, the EPA is trying to implement uh, a 30-some year old component of the Clean Water Act, which is called the Total Maximum Daily Load part of the Clean Water Act. And basically it says that every body of water has a maximum amount of pollution that it can tolerate before it becomes impaired. Mm -hmm. And that you need, to, you need to quantify what that, that, that maximum load is and you, make, you need to make sure that in, in any given day that that load is not, um, is not surpassed. Um, and so now each one of the states has to create a, a watershed implementation plan and explain to the EPA how they're going to uh, meet the total maximum daily load criteria of the Clean Water Act. It's a great idea. I wish they would have done it starting in 1973, you know, soon after the Clean Water Act was passed rather than waiting to 2010 and engage on this experiment. They, they break down the, the bay into sub-watersheds. So every, every river and every sub-river of the bay gets its own maximum daily load, depending on the, the hydrology, the salinity, what the uses of that body of water are, uh, and so on. So it becomes a very complex game of figuring out um, what the actual numbers are for each river. And so the first thing the states had to do was come up with those numbers. They've done that, and now they have to come up with these implementation plans, and they have to meet certain milestones in order to, uh, to make these goals. Otherwise, the EPA is threatening that they'll, uh, there'll be some regulatory hammer enforced if they don't meet their goals. Yeah, the Chesapeake Bay is the Susquehanna River in a, in a flood stage. We're in an interglacial period. The, the Susquehanna has flooded and has formed the Chesapeake Bay. The Chesapeake Bay is the Susquehanna. The Susquehanna is the Chesapeake Bay. Um, they're, they're one and the same. And I think when you look at it that way, you start to understand the importance of the Susquehanna and the importance of Pennsylvania, which, by the way, has not a single acre of bay water frontage to protect.
So they get no direct benefit from improving this body of water, but they're contributing a large amount of pollutions, far more than, than Maryland or Virginia, the quote, Bay states. And so regulatory burden is, is placed on them in order to make economic sacrifices for something that they don't directly benefit from. It's a, it's a political nightmare to try to get a state like that, a large, powerful state, to make economic, uh, take an economic hit to, to benefit Maryland and Virginia. Yeah, they're, they're, it, that has been a debated point. And so the Chesapeake Bay is, is they, from a scientific perspective, it's, it's nitrogen limited and phosphorus limited. Not every body of water is. So if you go down to the Everglades, they're, they're not as concerned with nitrogen. They talk about phosphorus. So depending on the salinity, the temperature, and so on, the Chesapeake Bay is doubly cursed because it's limited by both nitrogen and phosphorus. And the, and the, and the, two, the two behave differently. And so, you know, nitrogen will move through groundwater better than phosphorus, or worse, you might say, find its way through the, through the, the, uh, the groundwater, where, where phosphorus is, tends to be stickier and get caught up in the, in the groundwater. But there's, uh, they're both harmful, they both ultimately lead to the same thing, which are algae blooms and, uh, and then severe oxygen depletion in these uh, nutrient-saturated waters. Yeah, and, and every one of these bodies of water have their own, uh, their own problems. Their own, their own, their solutions are, are going to be different. If you're primarily an agricultural body of water, you drain agricultural areas like the, the Eastern Shore rivers or even the Susquehanna River, your solution is farm regulation. There's no, there's no two ways about it. If you're the Potomac River and you have the largest uh, sewage treatment plant in the region, perhaps the, the United States, the Blue Plains sewage treatment plant, your solution is to, is, to, is to regulate that specific sewage treatment plant, but not to forget about the, the other bodies of water that also flow into the Potomac. So we're on the, the Severn River here, and it's not an agricultural problem. We have no large agriculture here. It's not a sewage treatment problem because we don't have a, uh, too many sewage treatment plants, one relatively small one that services the, the North Severn side of the Naval Academy. But our problems are, are residential suburban pollution that comes through stormwater systems. And so, you know, you look at the different river and you, you, you pick your river, you pick your poison. You know, humans are doing something on those rivers that are, that are increasing the nutrient loads. Right. I mean, there's, there's two ways to think about that. What are, what are the major polluting industries? And agriculture is certainly top of that. Uh, but there are other polluting activities that we can't ignore. One of, that, one of those is land development. And so now you, you, you combine land developers that clear land, put in sewage treatment facilities or sewage capacity and septic tanks, stormwater systems, increase the amount of impervious surface, which increases the pollutant loads in a known way to the Chesapeake Bay and its rivers. And so then developers become a big problem. And then you have just the people problem, which are the sewage treatment plants and the municipalities uh, in those areas and so on. And so now you end up with three very powerful forces when you combine agriculture with developers, with uh, municipal uh, water manage managers and local governors or governments that, that are responsible for those, those things. And it becomes very, very difficult to fight those three forces, those three massively polluting forces. And so then you have to say, well, what's the flip side of that? Who's being hurt by this? And are they as politically powerful or influential as those people that pollute? Well, probably not. They're not nearly as well organized. So who's hurt? Well, probably number one would be the commercial watermen. But commercial watermen in both Maryland and Virginia are a dying breed. The bay's been in, in steady decline for over, for over 60 years. The number of people that make their living day in and day out on the water has gone down. And so now many of these watermen are, are part-time watermen. They'll work the water a little bit in the summer, they keep their crabbing license, but they're doing something else at different, por different uh, periods throughout the year. They work in prisons on the eastern shore, they're school teachers, um, they're in the construction business themselves, um, and, and so on. And so as an organized force, they've become 
uh, weaker and weaker over time. The recreational fishermen, uh, interestingly, have actually become fairly powerful because they represent wealthy people. The recreational fishermen, uh, however, have been growing in influence in recent years, whether it's the, the, the people that take you out on their charter boats and more and more of the former watermen are now these charter boat captains, or whether it's the recreational guy that lives on the water, has a lot of money, and is a member of a sportsman association. These people have grown in number, grown in clout, uh, and it sometimes are actually at odds with the commercial fishermen because each one of them is fighting for their small piece of the quota, whether it's the crab quota, the rockfish quota, or whatever it might be. And so you have a diminishing influence of the commercial watermen, growing influence of the recreational uh, watermen, but these two groups actually fighting each other over what they think are the most important issues, which is the management of the natural resources, the crabs, the fish, and so on, and they're only secondarily concerned about pollutant levels. And so then who else is there? Well, there's, the, there's the, the sailing community, which by and large wants to have a bay that at least doesn't smell so bad that it's offensive. There's the waterfront owners uh, that want to live by something that's not a liability but an asset to their property, and they've invested a great deal of money in that being an asset. There's the, there's the uh, vacationers that come to places like Maryland and the, and the Eastern Shore and so on. But if you add up all of those people and all of their influence, it pales in comparison to the political influence of the developers, the ag in industry, and those local governments that don't want to be overregulated to clean up their sewage treatment plants. And it's not that those, those overrepresented interests have more people. It's not that they have more people. They don't. What they have is more wealth, clout, and political organization. So you end up with a system that's politically out of balance. Uh, while most people in this area would consider themselves uh, environmentalists in favor of saving the bay, if you ask them. Uh, a bulk of them would even say that they would sacrifice economically, they'd pay a little bit more in taxes, or they would sacrifice a few jobs for a, a real improvement of the Chesapeake Bay. That, that political clout is not organized and amplified to the same way as those business interests are. And so, when you, it comes back to your original question, what's killing the Chesapeake Bay? And I'm supposed to say nitrogen and phosphorus, but the real answer from a political science perspective is a political system that translates and amplifies the interests of those well-heeled polluters, whether it's ag developers or, or sewage treatment facilities, and puts those, those concerns over the, the, the general public. Um, and that's the trick, by the way. The trick to restoring the bay is not a you know, figuring out which, which river has the biggest pollutant load. The, the trick is changing the political landscape so that it's in the interest of elected officials to do the right thing, to, to represent the public's general desire for a cleaner Chesapeake Bay, to overcome this, 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 this natural tendency to give disproportionate representation to those people that fund your campaigns and that make your political life easier. No, they, they have their narrow material economic interests in mind. You know, it's a, one of the problems with this consensus-based approach that we, we look at with the Chesapeake Bay program and these Bay agreements and everything is that we, we consider all interest groups the same. Whether you're an environmental group or whether you're an agricultural group or whether you're a developer, you're just another, quote, stakeholder. But that's not the case. Environmental groups represent the collective interests of society. They are not a special interest. They are a general interest group. So long as we all need to, to breathe clean air and have clean water and we enjoy natural resources in our public spaces, they're representing our general interests. Those other groups, whether they're, they're ag and they're fighting for less agricultural regulations or whether they're uh, developers fighting for weaker stormwater rules because it makes their developments cheaper and more profitable. They're the special interests that are at odds with the general interests. And, and we have to keep that in mind because it's, it's fundamentally important. Um, one of the things that distinguishes me from other environmental writers is that I don't demonize these, these economic interests. 
I understand what the business of business is. It's to minimize your production costs so as to maximize your profits. That's why they started their business. That's what motivates them. That's what their responsibility is to their, to their shareholders and to the people that, that, that invest their livelihood in these different businesses. And they're existing in an economic market. So if I'm Joe Farmer on the eastern shore of Maryland, and I, and I really care about the Chesapeake Bay, and I want to do whatever it takes to be an environmentally sensitive farmer, and in the process of doing that, I make 10% less, less profit than the, the guy right next door to me that's going to till his soil right to the water's edge, that's going to over-fertilize because fertilizer's cheap, he doesn't care if it runs off into the bay, that's going to have the cheapest possible way to store my, my chicken litter and chicken waste and so on because there's more profit in doing that. And that guy makes 20% more or 30% more. Well, the next year, when there's another 10 acres of property to buy on the eastern shore, who's going to be in a position to expand their enterprise? It's going to be the guy that has the more profitable business model. And if everybody's acting that same way, it's the, it's the dirty water business model, which maximizes profits, spreads like a plague through places like the eastern shore of Maryland. And the guy that wants to do the right thing becomes economically, uh, he's out of luck. Because he has to sell his product in the same market as the guy that's getting an economic advantage by polluting. So you want to change the situation, you take the profit out of pollution. And the only way to do that is the regulation. You level the playing field. So what that guy was doing voluntarily, the farmer that was doing the right thing, everybody has to do. And it takes the economic market advantage out of, uh, out of pollution. It's the only way to turn ag around. But as long as we have a hands-off approach to agriculture, those economic incentives will force farmers, even the ones that want to do the right thing, if they want to persist, if they want to stick around, if they want to send their kids to college and make their health insurance payments and be competitive in this market, they're going to have to play by the lowest common denominator rules. These are sometimes multinational corporations that tie into a global food market and they have a vested interest in Maryland because it's a place where they can produce chickens or whatever it is very cheaply. In, in my first book I looked at the, the political contributions of, of Jim Perdue. You know, everybody knows Jim Perdue. He makes the commercials on TV for Purdue Chicken. Everybody knows his, you know, his father you know, made the commercials before him and so on. Jim Perdue, his father Frank, and Mitzi, his stepmom, those three people Three people gave more political contributions in the state of Maryland than every environmental group combined. When you have three people doing that, and then you say, well, it's not just Purdue Chicken, there's Allen Family Farms, there's, there's, there's other poultry providers, there's, there's every home builder association, and so on. And you start to look at the numbers, and it's, it's, it's not even the same league. You have, you have almost every candidate in this region having their campaign coffers filled by these groups and the environmental community sitting it out. And that's, you know, that's one of the big shortfalls. Environmental community has done a very, very poor job finding their political voice. Um, just last year, they tried to pass what they call the most important uh, uh, clean water law since the Clean Water Act. And they were going to try to uh, reauthorize the Bay program and give it increased regulatory power so that it can finally do its job. And they thought, well, they, they thought they had a good strategy since they were only they were only adjusting the part of the Clean Water Act that specifically ap applied to the Chesapeake Bay. They didn't think that they would uh, raise the ire of agricultural interests around the country. And so they thought that the environmental groups would be able to go head to head with these, these agricultural interests and they might even have a chance of winning. Well, lo and behold, what they found out is every agricultural interest around the country has an interest in making sure the Chesapeake Bay is not the, the first domino to fall because the agricultural problems here are the same ones in the Gulf of Mexico and in Long Island Sound and in, in the Great Lakes and, and, and so on. And so the national agricultural interests fought like heck and, and, and just squashed these environmental groups. And by the way, since they were only trying to ch change the part of the Clean Water Act that applies to the Chesapeake, all the national environmental groups set it out. So now you had the regional locals trying to fight national agriculture and it, it wasn't even a pretty fight.
So the, it's it's hard to keep track of the the alphabet soup of these groups. So the, the Bay Foundation is a private, regional, nonprofit environmental education group. They get grant money, but that's not the it's not the it's not the bulk of their. They, they probably couldn't survive without it, but it's it's probably not twenty percent of their their revenue. So that group brings in about thirty million dollars a year in revenue. They have about a hundred and and twenty thousand dues paying members, and about a hundred and sixty full time employees. So it's a remarkably successful regional environmental group. If you measure their success in the size of the organization, if you measure their success in actually getting policy passed or having an impact on the on the political process, they're an abysmal failure, mm -hmm. and they always have been. Um, so with all of that money and all of that all of that staff. They've never given a penny to any pro-Bay candidate, not one penny. They've never advertised the voting record of a candidate. They've been very reluctant to even engage in, in low-level lawsuits. Right now, I believe they have one, one lobbyist, one federal lobbyist, out of the 160 full-time employees they have. So by and large, they're an environmental education group that spends most of their money educating school children in the summer and doing school programs. And it's a, it's a fine group, but the problem is that when the when the Farm Bureau and the and the Builders Association want to have their way in Congress or in Annapolis, their primary political strategy is not educating school children. And so they're playing by different rules and they're not maximizing the support that they actually have in this region. And unless that changes fundamentally, uh, it's just not a fair fight. Well, and so the, the money that was cut was 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 probably cut from the Chesapeake Bay program. And now and now since since the EPA has threatened to get serious about the Clean Water Act and to implement this total maximum daily load, the Republicans that took control of the House of Representatives are doing everything they can to defund the Bay Program and the EPA's implementation arm. And so there's a real threat right now that just through a funding mechanism, the total maximum daily load uh, aspect of the Clean Water Act is going gonna, is gonna to be brought back to the first peg and, and we're going to be back to, to square one. I, what would I do? I tell you what I would do is I'd get out of the chicken business. I'd get out of the chicken business on the eastern shore of Maryland, I'd get into aquaculture. And I'd start growing oysters instead of chickens. Because oysters are going to filter the bay. They're going to, they're going to lead to the livelihood of those watermen in that region. They're going to be very, very profitable, because they once were, they used to call them Chesapeake Gold. So every oyster you put in the water cleans the water. Every chicken you put on the eastern shore pollutes the water. The bay is, 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 is cursed by having a huge land to water ratio. As big as the Chesapeake Bay is, the watershed is far greater. 64,000 square miles draining into this relatively small, shallow body of water. And you cannot have intense agricultural productions in these little areas, these little shallow streams flowing into our little shallow Chesapeake Bay and think that you're gonna have a, che a healthy Chesapeake Bay. At the end of the day, we're going we're gonna to have to limit the number of chickens and, and, and pigs and, and cattle and so on. And so if I really cared and I was in, in, in ag, I'd get out of ag and I'd get into water uh, aquaculture. They call them best management practices. And so science has shown us what the best management practices are for ag. Every single one of them, by the way, is more expensive than doing it the conventional way. So here's some best management practices. Uh, one best management practice would be uh, not, not uh, using the land close to streams and riverbeds. So having not a, not a five foot buffer, not a 10 foot buffer, maybe a thousand foot buffer of, of forested land. It does many, many positive things. It creates habitat. It cools the streams so that the water is cooler than it would be if it was, it was, it was plowed under. Um, and it, it actually filters, it captures much of the nitrogen and phosphorus before it makes it uh, from the fields onto the, into, the, into the streams. So that would be number one. Number two, you would have a no-till process. So instead of tilling the soil, which is the equivalent of, of, of clearing the land for a new mall every year, right? So you clear every bit of vegetation off it through tilling, which leads to sediment, uh, sedimentation and, 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 and soil loss. You have a no-till system where you have machinery sitting, simply putting the, the crop in mechanically. It's a little bit more intense, but it doesn't, it doesn't have the same environmental impact. You would plant uh, winter crops. 
So in, in the winter, you would plant some crop that doesn't have a necessarily a great economic uh, advantage or benefit, but what it does is it sucks up the excess nitrogen and phosphorus that was left on your field from the previous summer. You would do less intense uh, chicken poultry. So instead of having massive, massive factory farms, you would, you would have smaller farms. And you would only produce as much chicken litter as the surrounding area could, could consume or as fertilizer, or you would put in place a mechanism where you would ship your excess chicken litter to places where they actually need the fertilizer. Um, you, would, you would invest in new technologies. There's a technology that, that allows you to take chicken litter, th these millions of pounds of chicken litter, and to convert it into power. The problem is that chicken litter, as cheap as it is, it still isn't as cheap as taking a rock out of the ground, we call it coal, and burning it. But there's a, there's a way to do that as well. There's a way to do all of this stuff. So, so you have the, the Omega Corporation, which harvests the Medhaven by the hundreds of millions of pounds. They use airplanes as spotters, and they go out there with massive nets, and they just, they just take this thing out. And the, and the Medhaven, by the way, is, is remarkably important for a number of reasons. One, it's the last great filter feeder, because the oysters are gone. They're less than 2% of historic norms. Mm -hmm. The oysters that used to filter the bay, that used to be like the filter in your fish tank, you can imagine what happens if you take the filter out of your fish tank. It's going to turn to muck pretty darn quick. But we still have many, large numbers of many, but we're taking them out in large numbers. And then when you take them out in large numbers, they're also the primary food supply for the striped bass. So now we have diseased striped bass, we have stressed striped bass, and people are, are itching their heads and wondering why. Well, because we're taking their food supply out. So you take a food supply out for your, one of your number one recreational fisheries, and then you're taking out one of the last filter feeders, and then people itch their head and say, well, why do we let one corporation out of Virginia have this massively negative impact on the Chesapeake Bay? and just go and look at their political contributions. Go and look at who defends this corporation. And by the way, this corporation isn't just uh, tolerated. They, they, they modernized their, their fish processing plant in Reedville, Virginia with a, with a very low interest loan from the federal government. We encouraged it to try to bring jobs to this impoverished part of, uh, of, of, of Virginia. Um, and you're right, and then they take the, the, the fish and they, they, they squeeze it and get the oil out, and then we get the omega uh, uh, oils, which are nice. But then they take the fish meal, and they feed it back to this, these livestock that we have, and they also use it as fertilizer. So then the nutrients find their way back in the bay. So you take something that was removing fertilizer, nutrients, and you, you put it back on the land so that it produces more nutrients. From a scientific perspective, it, it couldn't be easier. You know, take no more fish than will repopulate themselves the next year. And there are darn good scientists around here who can tell you exactly what that is, whether it's striped bass, crab, oysters, menhaden, whatever it is. So use science for your management process. Don't put any, any more pollutants than the, than the land can tolerate, period, whether it's nitrogen, phosphorus, sediments, or whatever it might be. Okay? From a scientific perspective, from a natural science perspective, the, the cleaning up the bay is easy. But my natural scientist friends are always one causal arrow away from actually understanding why don't we do these things. Why does the Omega Corporation have so much influence? Why does Jim Perdue have so much influence? Why do the, the bulk of the people in this region say they want to su support the bay? How can I, can I can go to the mall today and see a hundred Save the Bay bumper stickers driving around the mall today, but our political elected officials don't seem to, quote, get it? They get it perfectly well. They get the tangible benefits from these polluting industries in the form of campaign cash, and they pay lip service to supporting the Chesapeake Bay to these environmental groups that are quote, kept quite happy with small grants and educational grants and, and they keep busy and they feel like they're making an improvement and making a difference and it's this kind of feel-good approach. Everybody gets what they want, but the Bay doesn't get any, any cleaner because the elected officials are not held accountable for making the hard decisions. Yeah, at, at some point, common sense has to take over. And if I go to the eastern shore of Maryland, where there are no sizable cities, very small towns, 
relatively stable population, very small person to land ratio, and your body of water is completely contaminated and having algae blooms, and there's a you know hundred thousand uh, chicken facility. You know it doesn't take a you know a brain surgeon to figure out that there's your there's your source of pollution. And by the way, if you if you if you really don't think it's your source of pollution, let us come on your property and take some ground samples of your groundwater, and we'll see if your groundwater is polluted. They won't let you do that. They'll fight you tooth and nail to keep you off their property. Um, so you know it, it's. It's very easy for everybody to point the finger. Ag is going to point their finger at the land developers, and Ag is going to say this. This is their best argument. We've been here for 300 years. People have been working this land for 300 years. So it's not us. It's these increase in people that are coming that's causing this, this pollutant problems. The problem with that is agricultural practices of 50 years ago, never mind 300 years ago, are fundamentally different than what they are now. These intensive uh, confined animal feedlots, these massive industrial facilities where they put tens of thousands of animals in a single concentrated area, all defecating, all eating, all creating waste, is, is unprecedented. So it was the industrialization of agriculture, not agriculture in and of itself, that led to the, the decline in the eastern shore in these rural areas. That's, that's uh, I don't need to tell you that the appropriate use for a, a computer model in this type of thing is for forecasting. That's how it should be used. So it should be a, a way to estimate the likely benefit if you do something on the land. So if I improve a sewage treatment plant from its nutrient moving capability from a certain number to a different number, I should then be able to estimate the improvement that will happen in the water. That's that's the appropriate use for computer modeling. It's not that all computer modeling is inappropriate, but when you have computer monitoring, actual water samples, that's the appropriate way to know what current water conditions are. It's the, it's the difference between you know, using last week's weather forecast to tell you what the weather is today or looking out the window and knowing what the weather is today. I'm going to go with looking out the window. And I don't care how sophisticated last week's weather forecast was, looking out the window is always the better measure. In our uh, adversarial legal system, the environmental community is going to have to make that case and they're going to have to make it quickly. Because the agricultural interests, when the, when the regulations come, and they are coming, are going to fight this in court. And the first thing they're going to say is that they don't pollute. And the second thing they're going to say is you don't have the right to regulate me even if we do pollute. And so the, the environmental community needs to make that case with the best available science, with the best available information that they have. Um, it's, it's fairly watertight that these rural areas are being polluted by agricultural interests. There's, there's, there's no other show in town. Um, but they're going to have to show that. And they're going to have to show it through groundwater, through, through surface water, but through, through monitoring, through historical trends in the data, and show how changes in land use, agricultural land use, uh, resulted in the changes in water quality in the region. Um, the science is there. It needs to be... Uh, it needs to be gathered, organized, and made in a way that's going to be persuasive in a court of law because that lawsuit is coming. But there was a there was a, a good documentary made a couple of years ago, or a little over a year ago, called Poison Waters. And uh, uh, Hedrick Smith made this documentary. And one of the scenes was it's just unforgettable. The, the cameraman and the, and the investigator were at a, a massive poultry farm. It was a barn with tens of thousands of chickens in it. And they were talking to the, the person that represented the, the, the poultry operator at that facility. And, and he looked out and said, listen, this body of water is completely contaminated. And there's the, there's the drainage ditch coming right out of your barn. Aren't you responsible for this? And, and the ag man looked at him and said, I'm not responsible for this. There, there, there are fox that run across this land. 
There are deer that run across this land. You can't prove that those chickens in that barn are responsible for polluting this body of water. But it, it just doesn't make any sense.